everybody. I'm Sergey, and uh, today I want to speak with you about very special attack. We call it the stripe fly, which traverses the blue expanse in search of eternal wonders. And before I uncover what the hell does this mean, I want you to make a round of warmest applause to my fellow colleague, Sergei Belov, who was not able to join me on stage today, but who did an astonishing amount of work of analyzing and uncovering this sophisticated attack. So please, Sergei Belov, I hope he will see the recording. So, Dr. Jones, what he is looking for? And you met him yesterday on welcome dinner, right? Where is he, by the way? Probably doing something, searching for the artifacts. And he said very, very nice thing that I pretty much like, that we are lookalike, security researchers, archaeologists, cybersecurity experts. Because archaeologists is looking for exclusive artifacts, unknown relics, and hidden treasures. And that's what we did as a security researchers. We have an urge to search for exclusive malware, unknown malware, that nobody knows anything about that, that nobody speaks about that before. And of course, in this exclusive and unknown malware, we want to find something special, some hidden treasures, like unknown methods, unknown exploits, and something like this. And when we search for something like this, sometimes we do mistakes, sometimes we miss something. And of course, all we want is a very special malware, and we doesn't want some basic stuff like miners, who, who speak about miners? There are thousands of miners uh, uh, in the world, they're everywhere all the time. We want super cool APDs. But sometimes that plays a bad joke on security researcher. Imagine that you find a miner, fully functional, but a harmless miner. Well, harmless I put in quotes because there are no such a thing as a harmless malware, of course, but still, comparing miners to the Ransomware, it's quite different, right? And imagine you find a miner that has a full miner capabilities. You look at the code and it can mine on CPU. It can do a pull connection to the external server. It can communicate with it, send all this information, work time, hash rates, blah, 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 do all this kind of reporting. It's in, okay, it's a miner, nothing to see here, but there is something wrong with this miner, something wrong. And the first wrong thing is that this miner triggers a detection on all equation, old equation malware. This is kind of strange. Remember equation, the top grade malware, one of the top greatest malware ever created. What the hell is the relation with the miner? Maybe some false positive, maybe some just small amount of code is, is complete. I don't know. And the second suspicious thing that when we look at this minor malware, it was a lot of encrypted stuff in there. But all the strings related to minor were unencrypted. Like it was saying on purpose, hey, look, I'm a miner, nothing to see here, but why do you have something encrypted? And the third thing that was really suspicious and attracted our attention was that it was beautifully written, beautifully coded. It was a really, really beautiful malware with a very nice code implementation. And another thing that it was using a very interesting technique to hide it activities, for example, when it was getting its Windows API calls, so you know, to make uh, calls in uh, operation system. Usually these calls are obfuscated in, in, in most of the malware. 
And usually what, what's being used there? Like, like a typical hashing functions to resolve them, right? Like ROR13 or CRC32 and something like this. But not in this case. In this case, these guys were using a SAH1 or SHA1 hashing algorithm together with the salt. So you can't just hash all the functions and get their values like we always do with ROR13 or something. We all have pl plugins in our um, analyzing software. But in this case, it's not that easy because every single API call not was only just hashed with SHA-1. A unique value or salt was added for every call. So we had to brute force them. We just created a dictionary with all the API calls and we started to brute force the unique value, the salt, and that's how we were able to get all the required information to make a static analysis. Why somebody will put their API call, uh, sorry, SHA-1 encryption in a simple miner? So when we started to analyze, we finally find out that what appears to be a miner turned into the complex multi-platform, multi-plugin, malicious framework we named Stripfly with the key capabilities. Eternal blue ex exploit written from scratch. SSH infection, SMB infection, modules and vectors. Custom built or client written from scratch. Credential theft module, microphone recording, Linux version, and what do you think? A ransomware. It's like, okay guys, we will infect you, but if we don't like you, we will ransomware to the ground. Or maybe not, maybe it's just to hide its real, what, what it really is, right? Like, like with the mining models, they put a ransomware to, to hide its activities. Maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know. Okay, a few words about execution flow. When the SMB infection triggers, uh, it uses a customly written eternal blue exploit to infect the victim. Then the kernel mod shell code is being executed. It starts a user mod shell code, which runs in win init executable files. Then it connects to the C2, well, not actually, not actually the C2, but the uh, public repository, Bitbucket, GitLab, GitHub, and it downloads payloads from the public repository uh, provider. So quite, quite smart. Then the uh, actual payloads are being executed and the main functionality will start in persistent, C2 connections, and so on and so on, data exfiltration and so on and so on. So a brief overview of the modules. SMB Infector, which actually has a custom eternal blue written from scratch. So they didn't take uh, implementation that was like leaked in Shadow Brokers leaked or used in WannaCry. No, they created the own. Of course, the vulnerability was the same, but the uh, eternal blue implementation was written from scratch, so they coded it. It disables SMB1 after infection. So basically, it shuts the door after the infection. The machine wouldn't be able to be infected once more using the eternal blue. It's infects and shuts the door. Disable SMB1. Interesting part. The SMB infection module in the Stripe has uh, exclusions from target list. So the systems with this IP wouldn't be infected. And it excluded Amazon, HP, United States Army Information System Command HQ, US Department of Defense, and some others like some organizations in South Africa, some other countries. But we'll talk about it a little bit later. Shellcode and payload. So basically, this is an uh, example, the screenshot I took just a few days ago. The repository still works, so the data could be downloaded from the repository. And it registered in the name of Julie Hellman, which is probably some fake personality. And it contains some files, which is basically Windows payload, upgrade for Windows version, and Linux payload. And if you look at the number of downloads from the latest upgrade uh, update time, which was the April 22, it was 85,000 downloads. 
And in previous screenshot, that the, the previous update was done in February this year, it was 150,000 downloads. And before, and before, and before. And imagine for the last few years, we calculated about 1 million of downloads. So basically, it could be more than 1 million of infections. Uh, the payloads are kept in obfuscated encrypted form using SALSA 20 encryption plus LZO decompression. And after the decompression, the payload uh, header has uh, all the unimportant fields are wiped. So uh, the PA header contains only the fields that, has, uh, uh, that need the information to be reflectively loaded uh, into the memory. So they just make it quite straight. Wipe all the unimportant fields and put only the required ones. The Tor client, it's not based on any open source implementation of Tor. They, read it, they uh, created it from scratch, from the very beginning, based only on Tor network specification. So they created their own Tor. And I can tell you a secret, don't tell anybody. This implementation written better than the original Tor. But they made it, uh, they implemented less functionality. It has no routing directories list capabilities and it has no relay exit node functionality. So the only capability of their implementation is to connect to the C2 in the term network. That's it. No routing, no possibility of being an exit node or something like this. Just a straight capability. Credential harvester, which is uh, the usual one, every two hours it scans the infected system and uh, taking the information, login, username, passwords, personal information, Wi-Fi data, and uh, what is very important, SSH, FTP, WebDAV credentials. It steals this information. For Linux version, it has a lib secret passwords, SSH keys from SSH and known hosts. And what is very important, this data moved into the SSH infector module, which actually tries to connect to SSH server inside the local network using the stolen credentials by the credential models. It checks what system is SSH server is running. Is it Linux or maybe it's uh, Sigwin? And when it checks the version, it downloads uh, required legitimate DLLs to uh, decrypt and reflectively load final payload. Recon module, more or less a uh, typical one, computer name, username, MAC address, IP uh, address of exit node, and it checks the uh, uptime of the system and the, what is interesting, malware uptime. So it's, it checks how long does the infected system is being actually infected. And of course, it checks for the uh, if it has a root or administrative capabilities. Linux version. Linux version has almost all features of the Windows variants and everything, every functionality but is supported. But they did a little mistake. Even the best guys, best malicious coders doing their mistakes. When they were implemented, implementing the uh, modules loading, they didn't check that the muscle library using DL open function cannot dynamically load uh, binaries, uh, libraries. It cannot. And for some reason, they didn't check on that, that dynamic library loading is not possible. So in Linux version, screenshot staking capability, SSH infection, and password extraction, it simply doesn't work. Even the top guys are doing the mistakes sometimes, right? Uh, task module, which is, again, more or less typical to all other malwares, take screenshots, run processes, record microphone, and at least file the specific extensions like PDF, GPG, 
docx so basically it lists the documents and photos and all these kind of stuffs and it checks uh, this information then it can exfiltrate these documents to the c2 a sun decrypt ransomware so imagine first we found this minor module capabilities uh, actually the minor malware strip flight minor that has all these modules we decided to make a uh, how we call it, uh, retro hunting on this sample. And we found this very similar another one, but it has no minor capability. Instead of a minor, there was a Sun Decrypt ransomware implemented. Sun Decrypt is a self name, which is in the uh, node that uh, produced to the victim after the decryption. And it has some changes. It includes only torque line upgrade and recon and ransom modules. No credential harvesting, no uh, SSH infection or something like this. It was most active in May 2017. And the interesting thing is that this ransomware was noticed in 2017. There was a publication in Taiwan News that somebody was infected with this Sundecrypt ransomware. And he has no money. He contacted the operators of this ransomware, like we call a ransomware operators. And he said, hey, I don't have money. What can I do? My, 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 my data is, is in fact uh, encrypted. What can I do? And they responded to him and said, OK, we will decrypt it for free. You don't need to pay us anything. And they decrypted the data. And usually ransomware guys doesn't do this, right? They infect and they ask him for ransom. But they decrypt it for free. And he, this guy, the victim, he provided the lock of communication with these guys when they said, OK, we decrypt free. So questions, questions, and questions. The eternal blue. The most interesting thing here on the timeline is that the earliest known version of Stripfly incorporated internal blue that was created in 2016 if we compare the timestamps. But the original leak of Shadow Brokers was one year after, and WannaCry was one year after. And initial detection of Stripe Fly in our telemetry was one year after. So again, another question. Does the, uh, was this a first version of real Eternal Blue, or it's just a modified timestamps. We don't know yet. Attribution. It has a very famous <laughs> it has a very famous UID generator that uh, was implemented in the equation malware. It has a common refinement in using high-end encryption with basically the top guys doing all of them, right? All of them using a high-end high encryption. Excluded IP ranges for SMB infection, avoiding specific network ranges, which is interesting, but as you can understand, could be a false flag on purpose. To make it like, to show somebody like, hey, we are protected our networks in quotes, but Maybe it's not our networks, maybe just somebody put a false flag to, to show that these guys are responsible for this malware. Questions, questions, and questions. And the timestamps, of course, right? Modified timestamps of the eternal blue. Uh, or maybe not modified timestamps of Eternal Blue. Maybe this Eternal Blue was the first one, and only after this one, the Shadow Broker initial links appear. Or was it vice versa, and they just simply change the attribution? It's up to you to decide. Thank you, guys. Uh, this is Timosha Zaket, who is very intelligent and helped me reversing a lot of stuff. And he wishes you staying safe.